Welcome to the Media Library of First Baptist Church of Troy, Texas. We hope and pray you receive a blessing from today's message. First Baptist Church of Troy is a Christ-centered, family-friendly church which offers activities for kids, teens, and adults. You can learn more and contact us by visiting fbctroytx.org. Now, here's today's message. In Ephesians 3, Paul wrote this. It's actually a a prayer that he recorded. I pray that according to the wealth of His glory, that He will grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner person, that Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith, so that because you have been rooted and grounded in love, you will be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you will be filled up to all of the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power that is working within us is able to do far beyond all that we ask or think, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you, our hearts, our minds, our wills, And we pray along with the the Apostle Paul who recorded these words by the Spirit so many years ago. And God, we would ask too that because we have been rooted and grounded in your love, that you would help us to comprehend, Lord, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and thus to know the love of Christ that goes beyond what we can know that we could be filled up to all of your fullness, Lord. Father, you love us. You love us in ways that, and in depths that we just cannot comprehend and never will. But God, I pray that you would deepen our realization, our understanding, our willingness to, to learn and to understand the love you have for us. Father, would you teach us this morning as we open the Scriptures together. I pray that you would make the words that we study just come alive to us. We need you to do that, Lord. Your Holy Spirit is our teacher. Your Word is our guide. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Second Chronicles chapter 20 is where we left off last week, if you'll... Open your Bibles there in the Old Testament, somewhere in the Old Testament. Now, it's right after First Chronicles, after Kings, you find that. And while you're turning there, I'm going to uh, let me kind of sum up where we were last time. We're in this series, uh, Become, Be, Do, Becoming Who God Wants Us to Be. So we can do what God wants us to do, and in a couple more weeks, you're going to have that part memorized, and I won't have to say it at the beginning of our service, or our, our sermon time. But uh, we looked last week in Second Chronicles chapter 20 at a prayer for deliverance that Jehoshaphat and the people prayed, uh, and they lifted it up to the Lord. And we learned some things about this. We learned that prayer was their first response, that they prayed from an accurate view of God, They prayed God's Word and His works, and they laid out the situation in faith, believing that God could deliver them. And we left the people and the king standing before the Lord, waiting to see what He would do. And that's where I want us to pick up verse 13 today, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 13. And this is the discipline of prayer part 2 as we roll forward here. There's a scripture passage if you need to refer back to it. In verse 13, all the men of Judah were standing before the Lord along with their infants, wives, and children. Then, in the midst of the assembly, the Lord's Spirit came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite, and a descendant of Asaph. And he said, pay attention, all you people of Judah, residents of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, this is what the Lord says to you. Don't be afraid. 
And don't panic because of this huge army, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. Tomorrow, march down against them as they come up the ascent of of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the ravine in front of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not fight in this battle. Take your positions, stand and watch the Lord deliver you. O Judah and Jerusalem, don't be afraid and don't panic. Tomorrow, march out toward them. The Lord is with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face toward the ground. And all the people of Judah and the residents of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord and they worshipped him. Then some Levites... And some of the Kohathites and the Korahites got up and loudly praised the Lord, the God of Israel. Early the next morning, they marched out to the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they were ready to march, Jehoshaphat stood up and said, Listen to me, you people of Judah and residents of Jerusalem. Trust in the Lord your God, and you will be safe. Trust in the message of his prophets, and you will win. He met with the people and appointed musicians to play before the Lord and praise His majestic splendor. And as they marched ahead of the warriors, they said, Give thanks to the Lord, for His loyal love endures. And when they began to shout in praise, the Lord suddenly attacked the Ammonites and Moabites and the men from Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites attacked the men from Mount Seir. And annihilated them. And when they had finished off the men of Seir, they attacked and destroyed one another. And when the men of Judah arrived at the observation post overlooking the wilderness, and they looked at the huge army, they saw dead bodies on the ground. There were no survivors. Jehoshaphat and his men went to gather the plunder, and they found a huge amount of supplies, clothing, and valuable items. And they carried away everything they could. There was so much plunder, it took them three days to haul it off. We left our friends somewhat stranded before the temple of the Lord, calling out to Him in prayer. And if you'll notice in verse 13, all of the men of Judah, everybody came, were standing before the Lord, along with their infants, their wives, and their children, this is a family gathering. All hands on deck. Everybody is before the temple of the Lord, calling out to the Lord. And they are waiting to see what God will do. First thing I want you to see this morning, expectation in prayer shows our faith in God. Expectation. Listen, God answers His people's prayers. And if we believe that is true, if we believe that God cares, He hears, and He's eager to do something on our behalf then we should approach Him with an attitude of expectation. God, I expect because You have heard and because of who You are that You will indeed do something on our behalf. That's what they're doing. They're standing there before the temple of the Lord doing exactly what God told them to do in the Scriptures. And it makes me think of the passage that we read before we started uh, with our opening prayer this morning in Ephesians chapter 3, now to him who by the power that is working within us is able to do far beyond all that we ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever, amen. We serve a God for whom nothing is impossible. These people, when they stood before the temple and prayed, had that in mind. This God of ours can do anything. They knew the things that he had done in the past. And they knew what they needed him to do in the present. And they prayed and with an attitude of expectation, they stood there and they waited. You see, this is the God that we serve. He is someone who is able to see far beyond our understanding of what we think we need. And he can do immeasurably more than we could ever even think of asking him. That's what Ephesians 3 tells us. He does exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that we could ask or imagine. So you just take the biggest thing you've ever prayed for in your life or take the thing in your mind, in your life right now. Let me just ask it to you this way. Think about everything you have going on. 
And if there's one thing that comes to your mind and say, man, if God would just show up for me in a powerful way in this area of my life, it would be absolutely amazing. You got something there? He can go so much further beyond anything you could ever imagine it would blow your mind. And mine too. That's the God that He is. And remember the short prayer, the little short line that Jehoshaphat ended with? We don't know what to do, but what? What did he say? You remember? Our eyes are on you. We don't know what to do, Lord. But we're here and we are watching in expectation. And we are waiting for you. Friends, that's a good prayer. That's a great prayer. Because there's times in our lives when we don't know what to do, right? Right? You look at a circumstance and it is so far beyond your ability to handle or to solve or to deal with, you just step back and I, I really just don't even know how I should pray over this. Here's a great prayer for you. Lord, I don't know what to do. That's a very honest assessment of our ability. I don't know what to do. But I'm watching because I know that you do. And I'm going to wait and I'm going to see what you will do on my behalf, either what I have asked or something far better than I could ever plan for myself. Now, when we pray this way, it communicates to God, I am serious about knowing and doing your will. I really believe that you can do whatever it is you choose to do. Now, think about the other side of the coin, though. If I do not pray with an attitude of faith-filled expectation... I think it dishonors God. And I think that possibly one of the reasons that a lot of times our prayers go unanswered is that we do not have a realistic expectation that God will answer. Now listen to James chapter 1, 2 through 8. He's speaking of facing trials that we go through in our lives. And he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double minded man, unstable in all of his ways. And in that context, James is saying, Look, when we all go through various trials in our lives, and there are things we look at and we don't even know what to do. And he says, when you're there, in that place, when God is using something difficult in your life to help your faith grow, what do you pray for? He says, you ask God to give you wisdom. What does that mean? It means, God, show me how to obey you in this circumstance. That's it in a nutshell. And he says, when you pray for wisdom in that difficult time, the prerequisite for getting it is what? Starts with the letter F. Faith, yeah, you've got to, look, look what it says. He must ask in faith without doubting for those who ought, that for you should, you ought not expect that you'll receive anything from the Lord if you do not ask in faith because you are split in your thinking. It, it's like on the one hand, I'm asking God to do something for me, but on the other hand, I don't really think he'll do it. it it's double-mindedness. And God says, you know what, we're going to stop right there. Because if you're going to come to me and you're going to call out to me, then you have to believe I am who I said I am. I can do what I say I can do, and I will do something good for you. If you don't believe that, we have to tackle that first. Prayer must always be accompanied by an expectation that God will do something on my behalf. Now, it might be what I ask. It might be something different. But it will be good because it comes from my Father who loves me. And it will be done in wisdom because He knows all things. He sees what I can't see. And so anytime I am on my knees before the Lord and I'm calling out to Him in prayer, I can do what these people did. God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on You. I'm waiting. I'm watching. Because I believe that You will hear me and You will answer me. Now, the text doesn't tell us how long it was after Jehoshaphat and the people lifted this prayer to the Lord. We don't know how long they stood there. But look at verse 14 in chapter 20. Then in the midst of the assembly, 
the Lord's Spirit came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah. While they're standing there, and again, there's no notion of how long it took, but while they're standing there, the Lord's Spirit, who is this who comes onto the scene? A new character enters the story. Who is it? It's the Holy Spirit. Like Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He comes upon this guy named Jehaziel, and he's going to deliver the, the message that God gives them. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Prayer opens the door of God's provision. We come in expectation before the Lord and we wait for Him. And when we pray, when we have the faith and the courage to come before the Lord and lay it out before Him in expectation, it just opens the door for God to come in and provide. While all the people are standing there before the temple and they're waiting for God to do what He said He would do. And I want to stress that again. We touched on it last week. Remember, these people are praying from a specific promise that God made. Solomon, when they built the temple, he stood there and said, hey, if a day comes when we've got a famine, a plague, a pestilence, or some armies coming against us, and we stand before this temple and we cry out to you that you will hear and you will deliver us. Remember that? So these people are praying from a specific promise that God made. So there's a boldness that they have here. And that's important to remember because, you know, sometimes when we pray and we're asking God to provide things in our lives, we pray for things that are not necessarily from a specific promise of God. Things like, you know, uh, Lord, could, uh, I need a job. Could you give me this job? Or Lord, could I, you know, have that car? Or I'd like to find somebody to date and marry. Or God, would you help my kids to grow up and, and be godly? And those are all great things to pray over, and we should. But they're not prayed from a specific promise. They're just, God, I have a need. Will you provide? Now, God might grant them. And he might not, depending on his wisdom and the circumstances in his plan for our lives. But, for example, if I am praying from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, don't lean on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. And I come before him and, you know, Father, I don't really know what to do here, but you said that if I will trust in you with all my heart and not get sidetracked by what I can't understand, and that if I will obey you in all the things that you show me to do, you said you would make my path straight. In other words, you will help me to walk in your ways. God, you promised you would do that. I'm going to trust you to enable me. You see the difference? One comes from a promise. One is just asking for a need. God always does what he promises. God may or may not give me what I ask for. These people were praying from a specific promise for deliverance that God had made for them. And whether you're praying when it comes to God providing, whether it's a promise from which you're praying and you're like, God, I don't know how, but I know you're going to do that because you said you would. Or if you're praying, God, I have this need and I would really love it to be this way. I don't know if you will. But Lord, I'm going to just put myself before you. I'm going to wait and see what you will do. And if you choose to give this to me in this way, great. If you've got something better, great. I'll trust you. Whichever way that is, prayers of faith like that honor the Lord. Because we're saying to him, I'm, I'm praying because I believe you here. I believe you will do something on my behalf. I believe your promises. I believe you will provide what is good. I trust you. And I'm going to pray. And when you pray that way, it just opens the door for God to step in and say, let me show you what I can do for you. Whether it's what I want or not, it'll be good. If it's a promise, God certainly will keep it. He certainly will. Um, in the text, as we move forward looking at this, God's Spirit suddenly comes upon this guy named Jehaziel. And he speaks directly through him to all of the people. And it's important to understand that God used this man to answer the people. So the man is speaking, but the Spirit is enabling him to tell them what God wanted them to hear. And this was kind of a unique occurrence in the Old, Old Testament because the Holy Spirit did not come permanently upon people. He would come upon someone temporarily to enable them to do something or, or to give them a revelation from the Lord, and then he would leave. 
after Jesus goes back to heaven and the Holy Spirit comes, now if you trust Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit comes upon you permanently forever and never leaves. But it was different at this time in, uh, in history. And so the Holy Spirit comes upon this guy to communicate something to the people. Well, well, what does God want to communicate to His people at this time? To grasp this, I want us to observe two things. The first thing is, it comes from who is this guy, Jehaziel? We're going to see who this fella is. And the second thing, we'll just look at exactly what did God say through him. So I want you to see this. When I looked at this text and I'm reading through it, I see the Lord's Spirit came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, Mattaniah, a Levite, a descendant of Asaph. And I'm like, why did this guy's whole family tree have to be laid out in the text. I mean, they could have just said uh, Jehaziel, son of uh, Zechariah, and that would have been good enough. Everybody, oh yeah, we know him. We know his dad and his family and all that. But there's something really neat to see here, I think. If you listen to the name, the meaning of the names of these men, now check this out. Jehaziel means seen by God. Zechariah means Yahweh remembers. Benaiah means Yahweh has built up. Jael means God sweeps away. Mataniah means gift of Yahweh. And Asaph means gather. Now, if you take this list of names, and I don't normally do a whole lot with strings of names like this in the Bible, but as I look at the meanings of this, the names, and if you think about how the battle played out, look at it like this. They're praying and God chooses Jehaziel, through whom he wants to deliver this message. And so when, the, when people were reading this in, in, in the ancient world, they would read it like this, that God, he says, you, you have been seen by God. Yahweh remembers you. He has built you up. God will sweep your enemies away. And all of this as a gift from God. Go gather up the plunder. Now, I just thought that was fascinating um, because it just parallels what exactly what is going on with the whole account here in all of the meanings of these guys' names. And, and I think that there is there's something for us to grasp that. Every time the people of Israel would read this text after it was, re- was recorded, they knew the meanings of these names. They would read it and they would see these truths seen by God. God sees you. God remembers you. He's the one who builds you up. God has swept your enemies away. All of this is a gift from God. Gather up the blessing that God has for you. And I think it had significance for those people and then for us today. I I think for us to remember that God sees you. He sees you. He doesn't turn a blind eye to the needs that we have in our lives. He sees right where you are. He knows what you're going through. He remembers you. Anybody remember John the Baptist's dad's name? Zechariah. Yahweh remembers. And so when when God sent John the Baptist, his dad's name said to those people, I have not forgotten you. He remembers you. God is the one who builds you up. You can't grab your bootstraps and lift yourself up into spiritual maturity and grow in the Lord on your own. You need the Lord to do that in your life. Eventually, one day, God will sweep away everything that opposes us as we strive to follow Christ, sin, Satan, death, and all of it. And you know what? As His answers to our prayers come as good gifts from our Heavenly Father, And when we pray according to God's words, works, and His person like we learned last week, we need to be ready because the God who sees and remembers us and builds us up is the one who hears. And He will do something for you. He really will. He really will. Well, that's the messenger, Jehaziel, and his family tree. What was the message? The Holy Spirit said, don't be afraid and don't panic. That word panic in the original language, it means to fall to pieces. You ever gotten news and you just wanted to fall to pieces on the kitchen floor? I think we've all been there before. He says, don't be afraid. Don't fall to pieces over this. This battle is mine, the Lord says. 
You're not going to fight in it. You just watch me deliver you. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. All you have to do is obey me and, and I will take care of it for you. It's as if God is saying to the people who are terrified, don't panic. I got this. You ever hear anybody say, I got this? We got this, you got this. That's a very popular slogan for our culture. I don't think that it's accurate, though. Um, if you've lived very long, you know that when things like this come into our lives, we don't got this. You don't got this, and neither do I. We don't. John 15, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. That doesn't sound like he's talking to a bunch of people who got this. Sounds like he's talking to a bunch of people who don't got this, but need someone who do, or who does got this. One of the things about the Lord, I think that so that we will really believe that we don't got this, He is very willing and agreeable to put us into situations to prove to us that you don't got this. And that's what struggling and difficulty often is all about in our lives. A very present help and reminder that we need the Lord. That's where Jehoshaphat and the people found themselves They couldn't face those armies. They're going to get annihilated if God doesn't intervene. And you know, we find ourselves often staring face to face with difficulties and impossibilities in our lives that remind us that that we got this, I got this, you got this, they got whatever slogan just doesn't work if you're going to follow Jesus because he's the one who has it. And you know what? He's got you. He's got you. Last night I was playing shoots and ladders with Caleb and Nathan. And Caleb's 11 and Nathan's 4. I guess he went to children's church. I don't see him back there. If he was here, you'd probably hear him. But uh, we were playing shoots and ladders. And so we're playing along. And if you're not familiar with that game, you, you know, you, you move a certain number of squares and you go up and down the board this way. And sometimes if you land at the bottom of a ladder, you can go dee 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 and you can climb up and skip a couple of lines, which really moves you forward. But as you're going along, there's some slides, and if you land on that, you have to go back down. And so it's this whole process of climbing and falling and whatever. And now on on this game, there is one ladder, and it just goes all the way up, almost just to the top from the bottom. And if you hit that, you are primed to win. And there's a big, long chute that takes you all the way back down. And if you hit that one, you're primed to lose. Well, Nathan, we're rolling along, and he needed like a one yeah, we were using a, a dice because we lost our little spinner thing. So we're using it. So he rolls it and it's just... Brrrr, and it was a one. <laughs> he rolled what he needed and he, he just goes... Ah! And me and Caleb, we all threw up our arms and we cheered real loud. And he, he started moving his piece up and he went, God helped me. God helped me. God helped me. You know, and he's been saying that about things when, whenever there's something he needs to do or, or something works out, he yells, God helped me, God helped me. And in his four-year-old little mind, something good happened, and he connects that with God helping him. That's pretty good theology. Because you know, when it's truly good, not just something we like, but when it's truly good, God helped us. The more we pray, And the more we discipline ourselves to connect with the Lord that way, the more often we are going to be able to come to a point where we realize God did this. God helped me. And it can be as simple as a lost set of car keys. I can't tell you how many times I have stopped in my fury. (laughs) You know, because there's nothing like being late and the car keys are missing and just said, God, you know where my car keys are. And I don't. You know where I need to be. Please help me. Turn around and go, oh, that was easy. (laughs) You know. But it's, it's this. When I am disciplined in prayer, it just opens the door in my life to see God do things that probably wouldn't happen otherwise. Because in faith, I call out to Him. In faith, I call out to Him. That's what God told these people to do. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. I knew this was coming, God said. Look, he says, you can't handle it. I don't intend for you to. The myth is that I need to take care of this myself. And it's false. Because there's nothing that God wants us to handle on our own. 
He wants us to come to Him with everything, knowing that He's got it. And when you and I are following Jesus in faith, loving Him and obeying His commands, He's going to come through for us in our lives, revealing His goodness and His power. He decides when and what and how, but He hears our prayers and He will answer and He will provide. He surely will. Well, as we go forward, we've got to take note. What was the people's response when God delivered this message through Jehaziel? Look at verse 18. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face toward the ground. And all the people of Judah and the residents of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord and they worshipped him. And then some Levites and Kohathites and Korites got up and loudly praised the Lord God of Israel. Third thing I want you to see this morning, prayer opens the door for joyful worship. That's their response. King Jehoshaphat, and you've got to get your mind around this, in the ancient world, if you really wanted to humble yourself before somebody, and I'm not going to do it, but they would get down on their knees and lay their face down on the ground with their hands out. And kings didn't do that unless they had been defeated by another king and they'd rather not die and be tortured. Or be tortured and die. Probably goes in that order. But uh, that's what he does. And the king, the leader of the people, sets the example. He worships the Lord. And then all of the people worship the Lord. And these other guys just start joyfully. And the idea is that they're making a ruckus. No worship ruckus, I guess you could call it that. They're making some noise. Why? Because when they heard what God said through His Holy Spirit, that's like, all right, awesome. We're going to live and not die. <laughs> this is a good day. They're very excited. You know, had they relied on their own ideas to try to solve this and meet these armies in their own strength, they would have failed. They would have missed seeing God do something that only God could do. And God's reputation would not have been enhanced in their world like it was. What's the application here? Prayer opens the door in our lives for worship just like it did for the people of Judah and King Jehoshaphat. The circumstances we have in, in our culture today are different. But you know what? When we pray like this, it provides opportunities for God to come through in ways that only He can and that will lead us to a response that just explodes from the heart. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, like, like praying over something and seeing God answer and making that connection. Like when you pray it and you see God do something in answer to it, it's like, man, that's amazing. Even when it's as simple as finding your car keys, because you've looked for 15 minutes to no avail, and then you stop, you call out to the Lord, and he says, I knew where they were. <laughs> Why didn't you ask? And you're like, oh, okay, well, you know, thanks. It could be big, it could be small, but it is so cool when you just call out to the Lord and you see him do something in response to what you've prayed about. It's just like God speaks to you in that moment and he says, hey, I am here and I'm with you. And I'm working in your life. You can trust me. You can trust me. And you know, whether it's a worship, uh, a little worship service you have in your kitchen uh, over what God has done, or it's the worship when we all gather here together and we sing and we praise the Lord. When you are praying like we're describing here, you're going to worship better. You are going to be held in awe of God more often and you will, you'll draw closer to Him. It will happen. It can't help but happen. But you know what? The opposite is also true. If we fail to pray, we will miss out on the opportunities to see God come through for us. And we'll remain in a world where we struggle to handle things on our own. I don't want to live in that place. I have lived in that place. It's a hairy spot. It's very difficult. It's full of worry and fretting and anxiety and, and why can't I dot, dot, dot? I don't like living there. And I don't think you do either. And I don't want to go through my life not seeing the reality of, and, uh, the reality of God's power and His grace being poured out in my life. 
I don't want to have to be someone who observes God's power and grace poured out in other people's lives and goes, wow, that's pretty cool. I wonder what that's like. I want that to happen in my life. Don't you? Man, I know you do. Well, this is how you do it. You discipline yourself to pray. And then you get to be the one that other people look at and go, wow, it's pretty cool. I wonder what that's like. Well, let me tell you, right? You learn it through prayer. Well, we've seen that God told Jehoshaphat and the people uh, that they, what they didn't need to do, don't be afraid, don't panic. He told them why. This battle is mine. You just relax. They worship the Lord. And now look at verse 20 of, the, of uh, chapter 20. 2020. Early in the next morning, they marched out to the wilderness of Tekoa. Here's the next thing I want you to see. And this, you can't miss this. Prayer must be followed by faith and obedience. Verse 20, I think it's significant that the writer recorded the word early the next morning. Listen, they went to bed ready to do what God said. They got up and they did it. Doesn't even say that they made their coffee and cooked their eggs and had their granola bar or whatever and, you know... It says early the next morning, they got up and they marched out to the wilderness of Tekoa. Again, I think they can't wait to see what God's going to do. This is going to be incredible. We're going to go fight a battle that God told us not to fight. And he just said, you watch what I'm going to do. I can't wait to see this. And when they were ready to march, they're all gathered there. Jehoshaphat gives them a quick pep talk. What does he tell them? Trust in the Lord and you'll be safe. Trust in the Lord and you'll win. Hey, you want to win? Who wants to win? Man, I do. Every game I've ever played, I wanted to win. <laughs> I didn't win all of them. But you know what? You want to win in life? Who doesn't want to win? You want to be safe? Trust the Lord and do what He says. And then you let Him worry about the consequences of your obedience. It's all you got to do. When you boil life down, it really is this simple. Today, I need to walk by faith and do what God tells me to do. And if I get to my pillow tonight and I lay down and I did that, it was a great day. That is the bone right there. All the fat, the meat, the sinews are gone. That's the bone of daily living. And that is something as we've been going through this that, that has occurred to me and I have started praying, God, today will you help me to walk by faith and trust you and do what you say. And if I make it to the end of the day and I did that, I'm going to be fine. That is very simple. Now, it's everything that happens between that prayer and the pillow that we got to work on, right? But you can boil it down to that. And that's what these people did. God said, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I'm going to do. And they got up and they went and did it. They just did. And I, I love this. You can see their faith at work. Who did they put at the front in front of all the warriors? Who's out there first? The marching band, right? They got Wayne and Cindy are out there in the front playing their instruments and leading the way. And we're all praising the Lord. The musicians probably were not carrying swords and bows and arrows and shields and stuff and spears. They got their musical instruments. They got their horns and their harps and their cymbals and their clanging and doing all of that. I, now I think they probably have the greatest faith of anybody that day because Jehoshaphat's like, all right, guys, look here. God's going to do something awesome. Singers, musicians, get up front. You're leading us into battle. Yes, sir. And off they went. That's pretty neat. It's just a testimony that they know what God is going to do. The soldiers are there, but like, hey, this could be the easiest battle I've ever fought in my life. The singers are going in first, and God's going to kick everybody's rear. I love it. Hmm. God told them, you march out there. You find a comfortable place to stand, and you see what I do for you. And you know, this whole concept of faith and obedience in response to what I am praying, I, I was thinking, what does this look like in my life? What does this look like in your life? I, I want to share several just brief scenarios with you of things that I think all, all, all people eventually have this in common. We're praying over all of these things at some point or another. And this is God's answer to your prayer and what He wants you to do. That's what these scenarios are. So... I'm just going to kind of read through them. I will meet your financial needs. 
And I want you to secretly and generously meet the needs that I will show you. I will heal your broken heart and help you with the anger, and I want you to forgive the one who hurt you. I will provide you with a job, and I want you to be willing to go wherever I send you. I will bring growth to your church body, and I want you to go share the good news about Jesus with, and you just fill in the blank there. I will bring spiritual growth and maturity to your church body, and I want you to go and mentor and disciple, and you just fill in the blank right there. I will deliver you from this addiction, and I want you to share your sin struggle with someone who can encourage, love, and hold you accountable as a part of your healing. I will bless your marriage And I want you to love your wife as Christ loved the church and give yourself for her good every day and love her as your own body whether you think she deserves it or not. I will bless your marriage and I want you to submit to your husband's leadership as to the Lord because he is the head in your home. Respect him whether you think he deserves it or not. I will work in the hearts of your children and I want you to take the initiative to train them to follow me. The things we pray over will require a response of faith and obedience to God. In all of these, someone is praying about something. God, will you meet my financial needs so that I can be financially secure and not need you anymore? No, God says, I will not do that. I will meet your financial needs, but you know what I want you to do? I want you to take what I give you and cultivate a lifestyle of generosity. When I know that the pipe of blessing is open from me to you to others, then I'll bless you. Faith and obedience. Lord, my heart hurts so bad. So and so hurt me. I'm so angry. Will you help me with my anger? Yes, I will. You forgive them. Be glad to. You do what I tell you to do. God, I need a job, but I will never move here, here, or here. Oh, really? I'll give you a job when I know you're willing to go wherever I want and do whatever I give you to do. You want your church to grow? You know what I need you to do, God says? Go tell people about Christ. Go tell your neighbors and your friends about Jesus so that they too can come to know Him. You want your marriage to be joyful? God says, I'll bless it. I created it. (laughs) I think it's great. Here's what I want you to do. We must notice that our response of faith and obedience is the, a response of faith and obedience is the prerequisite for seeing God demonstrate His power and goodness on our behalf. Now that is a statement that stings me because I have prayed over things before with no intention of doing what God wanted me to do. I just wanted Him to do what I wanted Him to do. But God says, look, I will intervene for you. I will bless you. I will do great things in your life in agreement with my word. But you must trust me. And you must obey me, or we have to deal with that first. You see, without faith in the Lord Jesus to whom we pray, and a commitment to obey Him no matter what, we're not likely to see Him do many of the things that we ask Him to do. Why? Because there is is settled in our mind that I just want you to answer my prayer so I can move on. But God says, no. He says, I answer prayers. And I really answer the prayers of people that I know will trust me and do what I say. And that's something we have to settle beforehand in our minds. God, I am praying over this, and I don't know exactly what you will do, but I want you to know something from me. That whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. Because I know that you love me and you have a great plan for my life. And I want to walk in it. And if you need to surprise me with something, give me a moment to take a breath, but I'll step out in faith and obedience and do what you want. That's what God's looking for. 
And I think that is an attitude that takes prayer in our life from here with about this much result to here with a whole lot of result. Because we approach a God with an expectation that He is good. And He will answer our prayers and there's nothing that He can't do. And we come before Him with a heart of faith and obedience to do whatever it is He gives us to do. I think about the passage in Mark chapter 6. And this is really interesting. Jesus is in Nazareth, his hometown. And, he's, and, and the text tells us this. Then Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own house. And he was not able to do a miracle there except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed because of their unbelief. That is a staggering commentary from the Scriptures. They could not get over the fact that like, we know who, this is Jesus, man. We know his dad and his mom. There's his brothers and sisters. Man, who do you think you are talking this way? We know how you grew up. We know about your mom and how you got into this world. We know all that. Who do you think you are, man? Because of their unbelief, he was not able to do a miracle there. How in the world can God not do a miracle? How in the world, and I'm staggered by this, Jesus was amazed. How is God amazed at anything? But it says he was amazed at the level of their unbelief. Unbelief is the greatest offense to the Lord that you can ever lay down at his, before his throne. To come before the God who created the heavens and the earth and demonstrated His majesty and glory and power in a complex universe that is beyond description. A God who has revealed Himself through His Word. A God who came and walked this earth, who died on the cross and rose from the dead and did all of these things and yet to come to Him and say, yeah, I wish you could, but I just don't think you can. And we would never say it in those words, but we would come with that attitude before Him. Secretly in the back of our mind, like James chapter 1 says, Oh Lord, would you please make me wise? I don't know what to do in this difficult situation. I just don't think God will help me. We must not be like those people in Nazareth. But we come before the Lord and we say, God, I come before you, the God of heaven and earth. And I believe that you are who you say you are. And you can do what you say you can do. And until we approach Him that way, our prayer life will stay about that deep. And you know what the good news is in all this? If your prayer life is this deep right now because your view of God is about this big, you can change today. Remember what I said? You can't do anything about yesterday. It's over. Forget it. You can only do what God wants you to do now in this place, in this moment, and respond with faith and obedience to what God wants you to do. You can get it right today and tomorrow and the next day and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. And you can go forward and see the God that we are looking at in this text become that real in your life and in mine. And that's what he wants to do, if you're willing, if you are willing. Prayer, a disciplined approach to prayer, or a, a lack of a disciplined approach to prayer, I, I really think along with not being willing to deal with sin in our lives like God wants us to, I, I think it is the Thing that hinders what God would do. And we, like the people of Nazareth, are missing out on the amazing works of God because we just don't believe that He'll do it. And I'm right there with you. Me. Because I don't always pray with faith like I'm talking about. I don't always have that together. So you're not alone. <laughs>
But you know, God wants to do something in this church. We're at a really unique time in the history of this church. I really think that we're standing at a crossroads and God is saying, what do you really want to do here? What do you really want to do, people? Because there's more that He wants to do in this place and through us, I think, than we could ever imagine. It's going to take some faith. It's going to take us pursuing an uncommon existence in this world. And if you're willing, I know God is. I know He is. We're going to close in just a moment, but before we do, I want to give you a homework assignment. Well, prayer, faith, and obedience always receives God's best. I forgot to put that up there. It does. It always receives His best. When we pray with faith and obedience, you're going to get in on the great things God wants. So much better than we could contrive for ourselves. I want to give you a homework assignment. This week, and just get your phone out, take a picture of that. Um, this week, I want you to try something. Because, you know, one of the things I wanted to accomplish in this is that if you didn't know how to pray and spend time with the Lord, to have a time of prayer, that we could address that. And I'm going to address it by sending you home with this. This is the way I learned how to pray. In the seventh grade, my Sunday school teacher's name was Jerry Jones. Not that one. He sells insurance, or he used to, <laughs> in Temple. But we went through this right here, and I still remember it. And it's really simple. It, it's um, ACTS, Acts. Um, when you sit down to pray, the first thing to do is acknowledge God. Just spend a little time acknowledging who He is. I put a couple of psalms up there that I think are particularly focused on praising the Lord. I'll let you read those this week. And you can pick one, read part of it, and use it as your own little worship service right there as you have your prayer time. And then confession is when we come before God and we agree with Him about what this is sin in our life. And 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think that along with prayerlessness Failing to do that along with prayerlessness, like I mentioned a minute ago, is probably what holds most churches back from seeing things, God do things that He would love to. And so a time of confession is when I just say, God, you know something, I'm, I'm still under the influence of sin. Would you remind me, is there something I need to lay out before you today? Oh, yeah, yeah. Couldn't find my car keys yesterday, and I threw a spatula across the kitchen. Probably not righteous anger, Lord, would you forgive me? I admit it, I was wrong. Things like that. And then Thanksgiving, that's pretty simple. Just going through and spending a little time saying, God, I am so thankful for today and my home and my family and Jesus, my Savior, your Holy Spirit. You know, just things we're thankful for. And then supplications, big fat SAT word that means asking God for things. Uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. You can go read those passages. But this is a great model. And you know what? You're going to see some similarities to what the people did in Second Chronicles 20. When, remember that accurate view of God that Jehoshaphat started with? He praised the Lord. Yeah? He got his mind around who God was. They didn't do any sin confessing there, but um, there are other prayers where people have. I think about Nehemiah in particular. Uh, thanksgiving and then, you know, presenting your needs to the Lord. I'd encourage you to use that as an outline for your prayer time. It works really well. well listen, um, prayer. Guys, you can start today. You can start today, and you can, you can see God do more than you'll ever imagine. We're going to have a time of invitation now. I've gone on long enough. We're going to have a time of invitation. And, uh, you know, sometimes people come down to the front and want prayer for something or, or whatever, but whether you do that or not, the most important thing is if God challenges you to do something today, do what He wants you to do, whatever that looks like. You won't regret it, I promise you. What you will regret is if you don't do what He wants you to do, that disobedience just never works. Let me close this in prayer and we'll have time of invitation. Father, we bow our heads this morning and Lord, this, this thought of, of praying, man, it's just so challenging. But if we can become disciplined in our approach to prayer and when we can cultivate that in our life, we are just going to be amazed. And I pray for these people, Father, here this morning, those maybe who have who have watched online or who will see this in the future, that, Lord, that you would move in our hearts and you would challenge us by your Holy Spirit. 
and that we would draw near to you in prayer and cultivate that as a daily part of our lives. And Father, that's me and it's everybody else in here. We need it. And God, I pray that you would meet us there. And Father, whatever challenges you have thrown down to us this morning, I pray that you would help us just to come forward to you and to remember that you're so glad when we come into your presence. You just love us so much. Help us to make good on what you have challenged us to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. From the media team at First Baptist Church of Troy, Texas, we want to say thank you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or want to know how you can experience the love of Christ in your life and family, visit us online at fbctroytx.org and send us a message. Thank you and have a wonderful week.